When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who was touching him, and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him five hundred denarii, and the other fifty. Neither of them had money to pay him back so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The Gospel of John uh, quotes Jesus as saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that statement illustrates some powerful realities about the Gospel uh, that that Jesus proclaimed throughout his public ministry. Uh, Number one, uh, Jesus is the way, meaning a way to the Father, a way that has been blocked and lost ever since Eden is being made open again. That, that, that path has been impeded by sin and death, but sin and death are being dealt with in Christ. And the means by which we can now see this path is the truth, the, tr- the truth that Jesus embodies. He's given us eyes to see. He's given us ears to hear. We, we can now respond to the work that he has done and join him on this journey to the Father because of the truth that he has revealed. And ultimately that truth, our experience of that truth, encountering that truth, determining who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, and most importantly, what he desires to do in me enables me to walk forward in obedience and worship which ultimately equates to life in the Father. And so when Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was very much declaring the same thing that we've been reiterating throughout this series, that Jesus came to bring good news to all broken people. And that's the good news, that that a way has been made, that truth has been revealed, that life is now possible. And, And the really interesting thing about the revealing of this truth throughout his public ministry is so often, In fact, the majority of the time, this truth was revealed in contrast, the difference between two extremes, moving all the way from this to this. And we've seen it again and again in in this series. We, We saw a man who was held in complete captivity by a demon, released from that captivity and moved all the way to freedom. We saw a man who was blind, who lived in complete darkness, move all the way to light and being able to see again and again, we see this contrast and we see the difference that the gospel makes. And and this week, as as we dive into the passage that you just heard, we we get a really interesting opportunity to, to notice 
that distance, to, to notice that contrast. But, but unlike our other examples, it, it's not comprised of one person moving from one extreme to the other. In fact, both extremes are present the entire time in the form of two different characters. And so the unique opportunity we get this week is we get to see the tension between the two extremes. And, and before we can really dive in to that, we, we actually have to zoom out a little bit. We, we have to zoom out and gain a greater context. A lot contributes to this moment. A lot contributes to Jesus having dinner at a Pharisee's house. Now, the, the, the Pharisee that, that invited Jesus to dinner lives in a town called Nain, which is in uh, the region of Galilee. Jesus, early on in his ministry, spent the majority of his time in Galilee, began moving to other areas like Samaria and Judea. Um, but we're back in, in Galilee now in, in the city of Nain. But before Jesus made it to, to this town. He was back in Capernaum. We've already seen him do some stuff in Capernaum. The demon possessed man was in Capernaum. And so Jesus is back in Capernaum. He's journeying through Capernaum, doing what he does. He's preaching in synagogues. He's changing people's lives in radical waves. And he's encountered by some Jewish elders. Okay. So these would have been guys that, that, you know, lived in a town that helped lead kind of the faith movement in that town. They saw, uh, they ensured that everything happened at the synagogue, that type of thing. He's approached by these guys and they say, listen, Jesus, there's this centurion back in our town and his favorite servant is sick, sick on the verge of death. Now, a centurion was a Roman official, okay? So, so it was a Roman person who had been given, you know, certain responsibility within the Roman Empire. Um, it meant that they oversaw a military unit known as a century. Um, that was 100 men, so they were in charge of 100 Roman soldiers. This was a highly respected position. These men were highly respected within Roman society. But, but these elders go on to say, this, this is actually a really good man. Like, like he's become a friend to us. He's a friend to our town. He treats us fairly. In fact, he helped build our synagogue. This guy is worthy of your attention. Now, Jesus doesn't need to be convinced that anyone's worthy of his attention. So immediately he starts moving towards this centurion's home. He's, he's going to go and see what's going on and see how he can help. <coughs> and so as he's journeying, the centurion himself sends some of his servants to intercept Jesus and the Jewish elders. That somehow word has gotten to him that they're going to bring Jesus to him. And so he sends servants to stop them. And when the servants get to Jesus, they say, listen, here's a message from the centurion. He does not feel that he is worthy of having you in his home. In fact, he does not believe it is necessary for you to visit his home. And, and here's why. The centurion, he's a very powerful man. Okay, he commands a hundred soldiers. He tells one to go here and one to go there, and, and they do it. In fact, they carry his authority with them wherever they go, whether he goes with them or not. And so ultimately what the centurion says to Jesus is, Jesus, I believe based on what I've heard about you, that you are powerful enough that you don't need to come to my house. You can send your authority, whether you go or not, and I believe that my servant will be made well. And guess what happens? That very thing happens. Jesus sends his authority to the man's house and the servant is instantaneously made well. This is an incredible story that illustrates, again, some powerful new realities about the gospel. One that, that we easily kind of glaze over is, is Jesus is doing this on behalf of a Roman centurion, a Gentile, someone who is not Jewish, meaning that, that by all intents and purposes, he is an outsider, yet Jesus is sending the power of hope to him Two, this is something that the early church will look back on far later, realizing the far-reaching aspect of the gospel. But there's an even greater truth being displayed here in relation to the far-reaching aspect of the gospel is that the gospel, the power of the gospel extends beyond where Jesus is even physically present. Meaning he doesn't have to physically be there for hope to reign. Meaning that long after this, 
When, when Jesus would hang on the cross, when Jesus would be placed in a tomb, when he would conquer death, when he would rise again, when he would gather his disciples and say, okay, now the kingdom is gonna be carried out by you. I am commissioning you. Go make disciples of all nations. At the very end of that charge, when he said, and be sure of this, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. This is the type of thing their minds immediately would have jumped back to. Well, yeah, you can be with us always because your authority has no bounds. It can go anywhere. Your power can quite literally extend anywhere. You are everywhere. And so Jesus <coughs> continues his journey on from, from, from Capernaum, and he eventually makes it into this town of Nain. But he doesn't immediately go to this, this dinner party. In fact, as soon as he gets into this town of Nain, he, he encounters a funeral, a uh, very, very sad scene where we're told that it's the funeral for the son of a widow. Now, as sad as that sounds, it's actually way sadder than we may initially realize. You see, this was a time and this was a culture that was not always favorable to women. In fact, women had very few rights. They had very few opportunity to take care of themselves. Very much a man's world and men were the breadwinners. So women very much needed to be taken care of by a man. One of the main reasons you got married was to ensure that you were taken care of by a man. So to be a widow was to be in a position of extreme vulnerability within this society. In fact, if you became a widow, you hoped you had a son who would step in and begin caring for you. And so imagine, based on Luke's language here, the situation that's unfolding. It indicates that this is the woman's only son. This widow's son has died, leaving her apparently completely alone. If she doesn't have extended family that's going to swoop in and take her in, she is very quickly going to be homeless and very quickly unable to take care of herself. This is an extreme situation for this woman. But Jesus steps in and radically changes the circumstances. Unprovoked, he walks up and what does he do? He tells the son to get up. And the son gets up and immediately begins talking. He's talking to the people at his funeral. He is alive. And again, it's revealing a radical truth about the power of Christ. Not only is it everywhere, not only is it constantly present, not only is there no bounds to where it can reach, but this power, this power that he's unveiling, this gospel, this hope, it has authority over death. Not just the ability to prevent death, like on behalf of the centurion's servant, not just the ability to stop death, but here illustrated the ability to undo it, to take the full sting away. That's the power of this gospel. And so, so on the backdrop of that, on the backdrop of, of these seemingly small and scattered miracles, this, this, this picture is being painted of the power of the gospel. And then here in the town of Nain, Jesus is, is encountered by some very particular people. They are disciples of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist at this point, he, he has angered King Herod for various reasons, and King Herod has put him in prison. He's essentially a political prisoner, and King Herod has no intention of ever letting John out. He views him essentially as a terrorist. And so John is in prison. His disciples, they come to Jesus, and they relay, based on the things they're hearing about, based on the things that, that are getting back to John, they relay a question that John has sent them with. And the question essentially equates to this, are you really him? Are you really the Messiah? Are you really the one? God's chosen one. Are you him? And in, in, in all actuality, lots of people had this question at this point. Not everybody was asking it the way John's asking it, but lots of people were asking, who does Jesus think he is? Who walks around and does stuff like this? What is going on? on, but it's a little jarring for us when we get the question from John the Baptist, right? I mean, it's John the Baptist. He's actually Jesus's cousin, like, like by blood, like, like he's related to Jesus, but he's the guy who baptized Jesus. 
Jesus came to him in the Jordan River when John was out there baptizing people and, and, and came to him and said, baptize me. And John said, I can't baptize you. Why? Because you are the one. He declared it himself for everyone to hear. This is God. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one. It's going to take away all the sins of all the people. This is the guy. And he baptized them and the Holy Spirit came upon him and the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness. And then this public ministry began to unfold the very things that had been prophesied. So why on earth would John now be surprised by it? <clears throat> why on earth does he suddenly seem to have doubt? Well, the reality is I don't think John has doubt, in, in, at least not unhealthy doubt. I think John knows that he's going to spend the rest of his days in prison. I think John also has an inkling that that's not going to be very many days. The Herod's going to very quickly get sick of him, and Herod is likely going to execute him. But John also understands that a very high calling has been placed on his life. His job, his mission, his purpose was to prepare the way to prepare the way for the Messiah. And I believe that as John is sitting in his prison, as he's hearing these reports from his disciples, I think he simply wants assurance. And so the question that he's asking Jesus, the Christ is, Jesus, did I do it? Did I do my job? Did I run my race? Did I accomplish the task that the Father gave me? Was I faithful. And here's how Jesus responds. Luke chapter 7, verse 21. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now you think about this moment, like, like this is crazy, honestly, because Jesus easily could have looked at these disciples and go, well, you're asking me this question based on things you have heard about me. So go back and tell them, think about the things you have heard about me and the, do they not confirm I am who you say I am. But instead he says, okay, gather me a crowd. And Jesus just starts healing people. Jesus starts demonstrating everything he said the good news had come to do. Immediately, he is setting people free from demon oppression. He's setting people free from sickness. He's giving sight to the blind. He is overcoming the oppression of the people right then and there in droves. And then he looks at these disciples and he goes, go tell John what just happened. The undeniable reality of what you just saw and what you just heard. And you go and you tell him that it confirms absolutely everything. You go and tell him that he does not need to stumble on my account, that he did his job. And so Jesus sends these disciples on and they run back and they, they tell John, but, but, but Luke stays with Jesus, obviously. And so we stay with Jesus. And so as these disciples leave, Jesus turns to this crowd. And let's think about this crowd for a minute. Some of this crowd is going to be made up simply of bystanders. People have seen all this commotion. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening. So they've just kind of gathered around. But a lot of this crowd is people who just had their lives radically changed. They're people who just got cured of disease or sickness or affliction, or, or they were blind and now they can see, or they couldn't walk and now they can walk. Like there's a bunch of healed people gathered around but no doubt there was also at least a small population of antagonists, Pharisees, experts in the law who tended to linger around any moment like this looking for a window of opportunity. We've talked about it a thousand times before. They lingered around and they looked for their chance to attack, to argue, to refute the claims that Jesus was making. So no doubt they were present, but Jesus turns to absolutely everybody and he starts talking about John the Baptist. And he says, hey, here's a good question. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? Knowing that the vast majority of this crowd at least went out to, to see about John the Baptist. I mean, it was, a, it was a spectacle. People were coming from all over the place, but the vast majority of them likely got baptized by John the Baptist. And so he says, what did you go out there for? What were you hoping to find? Were you looking for a king? Yeah, you've been waiting for a king for a long time, haven't you? I, I bet you were looking for elaborate robes. I bet you were looking for a big strapping man that, that looked the part. I bet you were looking for all of those things, but that's not what you found, was it? 
No, you, you found a crazy guy dressed in rags. Well, John's not king. But you make no mistake, John was preparing the way for a king. And as I just declared, John did his job. You will never find anyone greater than John that has ever lived, but make no mistake, the kingdom that that king is bringing, the kingdom that I am bringing, the people that it produce, I make even John look like nothing. And what's happening here, what, what we may miss when we initially read this, is this is, this is one of many lying in the sand moments. We've, we've talked about this several times throughout this series, that, that, that when Jesus is teaching on the vastness of this gospel, on the power of this gospel, on the good news that's come from all broken people, one of the things that he reiterates again and again and again is that it requires a decision. When you encounter it, you have to respond to it. You have to make the decision. Am I going to embrace this? Or am I going to ignore this? But something has to happen. And that's essentially what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is setting the stage for this entire crowd, this entire crowd that is flocked out for whatever reason. Hey, right here, right now, why don't you make a decision? What do you think was happening in the wilderness? Why'd you get baptized? What do you think is happening right now? You can't just be spectators forever. How are you going to respond to this? And in verse 29, Luke tells us this. All the people, meaning that, that vast crowd, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees... And the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. And so Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? He's primarily talking to the Pharisees at this point. What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and you say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. What Jesus is saying, what Jesus is declaring in this moment, having just drawn a symbolic line in the sand, is that he is prepared to encounter the contrast, the difference and the tension between where we've been and where we've now been enabled to go. And they're trapped in the balance of it. He, he calls out a particular group. He calls out the Pharisees. And essentially what he's saying is you, you are classically unimpressed. You are consistently unmoved. You are constantly unprovoked by the truth that is being revealed to you. You always have an excuse. Nope, it's not him. Nope, it's not now. Nope, nope, nope just going to keep doing what we're doing. And ultimately what Jesus is declaring for everyone to hear, but, but directed at the Pharisees, is your pride, your pride is getting in the way. Your pride is holding you back. Your pride is keeping your eyes closed tightly. Your pride is keeping your feet stagnant. Your pride has made you captives to your own indifference. And it's in this moment, this, this moment, we, we see this like very abrupt shift. Okay, the reality is this moment probably lingered for, for quite a while. I mean, these Pharisees would not have liked hearing this, but, but it, it moves very abruptly. And then we immediately go to the dinner party. And so it leaves us believing almost as though like, like these guys who are classically lacking self-awareness just lean into that, that lack of self-awareness. And one of them named Simon stepped forwards in the middle of this heated accusation and goes, hey, Jesus, you want to come over for dinner? 
That probably didn't happen that, that abruptly, but, but that's how quickly Luke moves. Immediately, Luke moves to this dinner party. Verse 36 tells us this, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And so, so we take it to mean that this is that very evening. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. The way that Luke describes this woman was a subtle and gentle way of expressing the fact this woman is a prostitute. As we've already said, this is a culture and a time that was relatively unkind to women. This is a man's world. Women had very little opportunities to take care of themselves. We we can gather that this woman is, is likely not married or she herself could be a widow, or her husband could have left, but but currently she's on her own, and the only means she has found by which she can take care of herself is selling her body for the gratification of other people, namely men. And so that's what she does. That's what she is. That's what she has become. And the, the most likely question that we all have is, why is she here? Why is she at this dinner party? And why is no one seemingly alarmed by her presence? Well, we got to understand it's a very different time. It's a very, very different culture and a very, very different scenario than, than we're familiar with now. I think sometimes when we read the Bible and we read about these towns, we, we picture towns like ours, you know, pretty good size, more sprawling, spread out. But that wasn't the case back then. Everybody was kind of right on top of each other. And these were not big towns. These, these were, by our definition, very small towns. Everybody would have kind of known everybody else's business. They, they also had a far more communal culture than we're used to. Not only was everybody in everybody else's business, everybody was just kind of okay with that. Like that's just how it worked. And so most homes didn't even have locks on their front door. I mean, that was just the way it is. But most homes when hosting a party didn't even close their front door. They'd leave it wide open so that none of your guests had to wait. They could just walk right in and join the party. Well, what that inherently resulted in is other people walked in and joined the party. It was very, very common. It was very, very common that a beggar off the street would just wander in thinking, wow, free meal. That uninvited guests would just show up and say, well, I'm invited now. Like, like People would just wander in. There would have been nothing to stop them. And so this woman, she, she walked in unimpeded. Nobody would have gotten in her way. That's how she ended up here. But why is she here? Well, it's, it's made clear very, very quickly. She's come for a very specific purpose. She came to worship, to worship Jesus. And she seizes her opportunity. And what, what does she bring? She, she brings a, a, a large jar full of perfume. Now, to us, like that's something you, you go to Dillard's and you get any time you want. But perfume was a very big deal back then. It was rare. It was costly. Incredibly expensive. And so this likely symbolizes the majority, if not all, of this woman's wealth. The fact that she was able to acquire this jar of perfume and she has brought it for one purpose she's she's going to dump it on Jesus's feet and she doesn't just do that she also washes his feet this is an incredibly humbling act I mean this is like the lowest you can make yourself the 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 act of washing someone else's feet that was something that was reserved for the lowest of slaves yes she does it she also let down her hair Huge cultural no-no. That that was women becoming way too vulnerable in public. Nobody would have done that. It's literally equal to exposing yourself. And all the while she's she's weeping uncontrollably, so moved simply by the presence of Jesus. Now to some, this is an extremely beautiful situation. It's hard to comprehend how truly beautiful this moment is. However, to others, this is a moment of extreme offense. And our host, Simon the Pharisee, 
He fits into the second category. Verse 39, when when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Now, a few moments ago, we kind of made a joke because of the abruptness of moving from one scene to the other, that it's possible that Simon, full of self-awareness, stepped forward in the midst of being accused uh, of being blinded to the truth and say, hey, you want to come to dinner? We kind of made him out to be kind of a a moron, which would not have been the case. Like in all reality, Pharisees weren't dumb. In fact, to be a Pharisee, you actually had to be pretty smart. Like these were guys that had their wits about them. And the reality is we we don't 100% know Simon's motives in in inviting Jesus to dinner. He refers to him as rabbi at at times. So so it's likely that that he at least had some respect to Jesus. But knowing how Pharisees work and seeing their track record throughout the gospel, it is safe to assume that that at least a portion of why Jesus has been invited to this dinner is at least some form or fashion of a test. At the very least, this is an opportunity for the Pharisees to put this rabbi under the microscope and see, is he legit? Is he really who he says he is? Does he really carry the authority that everybody's come to believe that he carries? Is is he that big of a deal? And in this moment, Simon concludes to himself internally, no, he is not. Why? Because if he was a prophet, if he was a prophet, he'd see the bigger picture at all times. If he was a prophet, he'd have insight the rest of us don't have. If he was a prophet, he'd know who this woman is because I know who she is. I know where she's been. I know what she's done. I know she's unclean. He obviously does not. This guy's not a prophet. And so Simon's sitting across the table and he's stewing on this. But as Jesus so often does, Jesus interrupts his thought process. Verse 40, Jesus answered him. Notice Simon has not said anything out loud, yet Jesus is answering the questions formulating in his head. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Now, a good way to prove that you're a prophet is is show the ability to read people's thoughts. Jesus did this all the time. In fact, to the Pharisees, he did this a lot. He'd see these questions forming in their minds, so he would answer the questions before they even asked the questions. It had to drive them crazy. And so in this moment, he sees what's going on in Simon's head, and he immediately addresses it. I know what you're thinking, Simon. You're thinking, I don't know her. I do know her, but more importantly, I know you. And so he gives them this parable. There's two people there in you know, debt. One of them's in extreme debt. One of them's just kind of in debt, but neither of them can pay it. And the master comes to him and says, I'm forgiven both. Who do you think is going to be more excited about that, Simon? And Simon says, well, obviously the person in extreme debt, the, their debt has been forgiven. That's, that's, that's a game changer. That's, that's a big deal. And Jesus says, exactly. Good job, Simon. You, you've judged exactly correct. And then he turns back to the woman, verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, Her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. This is not the first time that Jesus has found himself in the midst of a test by the Pharisees, and it certainly would not be the last. This is also not the first time, nor would it be the last time, that Jesus turns one of those tests on its head. 
head. Now, scholars believe that it is most likely that this woman has encountered Jesus before this moment. Luke kind of reveals that earlier. She hears that Jesus is at this party and she knows I have to get there. And so she has likely crossed paths with Jesus at some point, but we don't know when, we don't know where, and we don't know what uh, under what circumstances, but at some point or another, hope has been revealed to her. And her coming to this party and her responding to Jesus in the way she does shows that she has made the conscious decision that she is going to respond to that hope. How? By showing him honor, by worshiping him. And what Jesus is saying in this moment to Simon is your goal was to get me here to put me under a microscope. Her goal was to get here and worship me. Why? Because she understands the depth of the good news that I am bringing, and you, you do not. And Jesus illustrates this by simply walking through hospitality 101 for that time, place, and culture. You wanted to show hospitality to somebody? You wanted somebody to know they were welcome in their home? The very basic thing you would do is as they came in, you would have a foot washing station. You would have a place where they can clean clean their feet. Why? Because feet back then were disgusting, because roads were disgusting, and they all wore sandals. It was gross. But culturally and even religiously, to bring dirty feet into somebody's home and especially to a dinner table was a huge no-no. And you didn't want to put your guests in that position. So what did you do? You made a way for them to avoid it by giving them the opportunity to wash their feet. Simon didn't do that. You really wanted to honor somebody, you'd have a servant waiting at the door who would do it for them. Simon didn't do that. If you really, really wanted somebody to feel welcome, as soon as they walked in, you'd greet them, what was called a holy kiss. You'd give them a peck on the cheek. Simon didn't do that. And if you really, really, really wanted somebody to feel welcome, you really, really, really wanted to honor your guests, after you gave them that holy kiss, you'd take some olive oil and you'd anoint their forehead to symbolically speak a blessing over your guest. And Simon didn't do that. But that woman, she did all of that. And she did it far more lavishly than she was expected to. She didn't just wash Jesus' feet with water and a towel as customarily done. She washed Jesus' feet with her own tears and her hair. She didn't kiss Jesus on the cheek. She kissed him on his dirty feet. She didn't anoint his head with common olive oil. She anointed his feet with costly perfume. Why? Because this woman understood worship. This woman had come to understand the response that the good news requires. It's not, what is the minimum I can do in response to this? It's how lavish can I pour myself out in response to Christ? And all of this, Simon's lack of a response, And this woman's abundance of response, all of this exposes the condition of Simon's heart. This story, this moment, this is not about social order. This is about the corruption, more importantly, the oppression of sin. Jesus has met this woman before. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know why. It's very possible that she was included in that group of people that was just recently healed of whatever their affliction was. But at some point she has heard hope and she has responded to it. But Simon has made the conscious decision not to show any honor whatsoever. Why? Because he has not encountered hope. You see, this entire time, we have likely allowed ourselves to believe that the oppressed person in this story The person on the wrong side of the contrast is this woman. She's who's held back by sin. She's who's broken. But she, in fact, is the one who's been set free. The oppressed one, the captive one, the blind one, the paralyzed one, the lost one, it's Simon. Because he doesn't know hope. He knows a lot about hope but he's never encountered it. He's never let it change his heart. He's never allowed it to redeem him. Here's how Luke wraps this whole thing up. Verse 48, 
Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who, who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Again, J Jesus draws the hard line between response and faith and forgiveness to reiterate again that when I bring this hope, when I display this hope, you'll have to make a decision in response to this hope. You'll have to decide, am I who I claim I am? Have I done the things I said I would do? And are you going to allow me to do those same things in your heart? The response to hope must be humble repentance, the desire to move in a new direction that Jesus has made possible and this woman does that and that's why she can now go in peace she can now learn to walk forward with Jesus in obedience and worship she has been restored and you'll notice the other people at the table like can this even happen can he do this can he forgive sins is this real but you know the one person we don't know anything about after this is Simon Luke just completely moves on it's infuriating, honestly, like, like he just completely moves on. Like, like he jumps to chapter eight and immediately we're somewhere else and Jesus is back to doing what he was already doing, moving town to town and preaching the good news to broken people. We have no idea what Simon did and Luke does this constantly. He takes us to the edge of the cliff and he just leaves us there. Why? Because it doesn't ultimately matter what Simon did. It matters what you do. The more you read the gospel, the more you work your way through it again and again and again, which I would encourage you to do, spend as much time in the gospel as you possibly can, but look at the words of Jesus. Not just what he said, but who he was always saying it to. The vast majority of the time, Jesus is talking to Jews who would have already had somewhat of an idea about all this stuff. He was talking to people who already knew. Have you ever wondered why God, th throughout the extent of his story, is always calling his people to repeat these things, to, 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 to hold these annual celebrations, to hold these annual feasts. I mean, they're countless in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, even now in our tradition, there's things that we just keep doing over and over and over again. We're right in the middle of one of them, Christmas. Why do we do this every year? Every single year we, we celebrate the, the same stuff. Every single year we look at many of the same passages. Every single year we do this. Are we doing it for people that don't know what Christmas is? I don't think that's the case. I don't think we, we celebrate Christmas every year. I don't think God calls us to come back to these things again and again and again to inform people who don't know. Meaning, I, I don't think the primary purpose of celebrating Christmas is evangelistic. Make no mistake, it can be. It can deliver hope to people who haven't heard before, but I don't think that's the primary reason why we celebrate it every single year. I think the reason we do this stuff again and again and again is not for people who don't know, but for people who do know. It's not to inform, it's to remind. Because we are people who are prone to forget. We are people who are prone to walk back into captivity, who to submit to blindness after having once seen, who allow ourselves to fall back under the banner of oppression again and again and again. And I believe that the fact that we've been called to these annual reminders, these annual celebrations, is that we would hear these words that we repeat all the time with fresh ears. And that we would seize this opportunity to wake up, to stop walking around in a stupor, blinded by our own pride, our own complacency, but instead to be willing to see Jesus more clearly and then to respond. See, the beauty of this story is it, it reminds us that once we've encountered hope, and it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter how, but if you have, 
It should drive all of us to the exact same place. Not leaning back complacently in our seat, but humbly falling on our knees at the feet of Jesus again and again and again. That's what that, this time of year invites us to. There's, there's ample traditions, there's ample fun, there's, there's merriment and joy all around us. But the point of this, the point of all of this, the point of remembering is that it would drive us to the feet of Jesus. And that we would remember that this king wasn't just born, he reigns here and now and for all of eternity. And we are invited not just to hear about hope, to step into that hope, to respond to that hope, to have absolutely everything about our existence changed and altered by that hope. And that hope has a name. It's Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for that truth, that our hope has a name and that the name of our hope is Jesus and that there is no name greater. There is no name that is higher. There is no name that is more capable of overcoming our darkness and bringing about lasting, soul-reviving light. And Father God, we wanna be people of that light. We want to bask in it. We want to celebrate in it. We want to enjoy it. We want to thrive in it, but we want to carry it and chase darkness out of all the corners of this earth because of the mighty name of Jesus in honor of the mighty name of Jesus in worship to the mighty name of Jesus in obedience to the mighty name of Jesus. And so Father God, do what you must do in us that our posture would change and that we would find ourselves in this season and every season to follow, falling at the feet of Jesus, our King, knowing what awaits us there, peace and mercy and forgiveness and healing. And then may we boldly trust him as he leads us forward to be bringers of his kingdom changers of this world that so desperately needs it. And in all of this, Father, may you be glorified in and through us. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.